Do, 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 theme song. Do, 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 I'm broke, so this is my theme song. Do, 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 just imagine this is an awesome theme song. Do, do, theme song. Left of the box. Check, check. God damn it, it was OBS. <laughs> I have to start like all of this over again, don't I? <laughs> oh. Check the cord. There was no bite marks, but uh, it wasn't quite showing up. OBS did an update today and I totally missed it. <laughs> Uh, the, the, yeah.
It was OBS. And then, yeah. Ah! Ah! Why don't I just kind of back up a bit and start all over again? How about that? Because I had... I nailed that intro! <laughs> just one moment. Do, do, do. Theme song. Do, do, do. I'm broke, so this is my theme song. Do, do, do. Just imagine this is an awesome theme song. Do, do, theme song. Left of the box. Hello, welcome to Left of the Box. Bonjour, bienvenue. I'm Sandy. You can hear me this time, hopefully. Anyway, as I was saying, has anything happened in the news recently? I don't know, something important that maybe I should cover, you know, something that's been blowing up in the news feed, haha. <laughs> oh, there are two things I'm going to be covering in today's live stream that I wasn't planning on covering either. But truth be told, I was planning, or not planning, I was, I did know that Iran would eventually hit back. I just didn't know when. So that's in the news. And then Bill Maher decided to talk about Canada, only it turned out that it was just a transphobic and anti-immigration rant. <laughs> it was just cover for that. So we'll be going over both of those today. Uh, and we'll see how long that takes. I might not be able to get to much more than that. Because between the two, there's a lot to cover. In the sandbox, we have Soul Life, Kelly Bach, Lightning Rod. Welcome. I don't think I've seen you before. First time in the sandbox. I appreciate it. Hopefully, this little snafu isn't too much of a turn off. I'm a real YouTuber. Uh, Looney Tunes 9000, Lord Foxy 13. Don't know if I've seen you in the sandbox either. Welcome. <sighs> uh, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, we got we got all you people. Okay, I'm just hoping that the uh, live stream will start to populate now. Not before, but now. Because <laughs> I put in a lot of work into um, the Bill Maher segment. Because that one, it, it, it pissed me off a little. It peeved me. It peeved me a lot. Just so much misinfo. Like, I have no issues with Americans, you know, talking smack about Canada, because I do it to Americans all the time. I take issue when it's misleading and false information. Uh. Oh, hello, Bob. Oh, Lord Foxy saying, I've been in the comment section, not often in the chat. Ah. And it's also entirely possible that I see people's names and totally forget because I'm horrible with names. <laughs> or people change their names. Oh, but yeah. Just wondering, like, so much in the news to go over with Iran retaliating, not attacking. Oh, it is watching the news is so frustrating because it's always like, Iran attacked, Iran did this, Iran's starting World War III, they, they, they want revenge and all this, and they totally neglect to mention the reason why there was an attack, a lot of the mainstream media anyway. Um, and I'm going to cover it as best I can with, you need to put in a huge grain of salt right now because all of this is still new information. It's, especially with Twitter the way it is, it's so hard to know what is real. What is real news? What isn't real news? What footage is real? What footage isn't? So I'm going to stick to a few reliable sources, sources that I, I trust a little bit more, and see what we can piece together. But like I said, this isn't exactly shocking that this happened because Yesterday, before I even knew about Iran's uh, retaliation attack, I actually posted a segment that I did, a clip, about this very issue. It, it went live, and 
and it was about Israel, you know, fucking around to, and waiting to find out. And now they're finding out. And there's so many... There's so much that is wrong with this because there's so many layers is what it is with why Israel did what they did what the media here is doing and everything and it gets very complex and you need to be nuanced in these conversations you always also need to you always also need to add the disclaimer of well i don't really like the way iran runs you know i'm not applauding what they did <laughs> because for some reason somebody as leftist as me needs to point out that you know regimes like the iranian regime is bad or like most uh, nation states regimes are bad. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, Canada definitely has its bloody history and current happenings. The United States, and then there's the countries we support, like Saudi Arabia and Israel. And then there's the countries we don't support, like Iran and China. Like, it's just, there, there's no good players in this. And it's the people, the civilians of all of these nations that end up suffering in the end. Because these power brokers of war and arms and money and settler colonialism and white supremacy and nationalistic viewpoints, it's all them playing it out and we're just the pawns in the middle. Ah. <sighs> Okay, so why don't why don't we just get into it? So Al Jazeera is generally speaking a more reliable source when it's been coming to this the happenings in the Middle East. So they have this article here: Iran attacked Israel with over three hundred drones, missiles. What you need to know, and this is a very recent article, as in today. So hopefully, it has covered a lot of you know, cleared up a lot of the stuff that has been going around. Iran unleashed a barrage of missiles and drones on Saturday and during the early hours of Sunday targeting Israel in retaliation for last week's suspected Israeli strike on its consulate in Damascus that killed 13 people. Here is what happened and what analysis say could happen next. What happened in Israel and when? Iran launched a massive aerial attack on Israel two weeks after suspected Israeli strike on consulate in Syria. This marks the first ever direct attack by Iran on Israeli territory from Iranian soil. Iran called the attack Operation True Promise. Oh, they always think of the weirdest names for these things. Like everyone, like not just Iran, like everyone. Americans, Canadians, it's all very weird cutesy names that, you know, it, it, you know, this isn't a novel. This isn't a spy novel that we need interesting titling for. The attack began on Saturday night around 20 GMT. I, I don't know what time that is locally here in Eastern Standard Time. It lasted approximately five hours, according to U.S. officials. During the attack, explosions were heard in cities across Israel, including Tel Aviv. The explosions were also heard in Jerusalem, and air raids sirens sounded in more than 720 locations as Israeli forces sought to shoot down the projectiles. Israel's chief minister... Israel's chief military spokesman, Daniel, um, Daniel said Iran's attack involved more than 120 ballistic missiles, 170 drones, and more than 30 cruise missiles, according to a report by the Associated Press news agency. The Israeli military also said that the vast majority of the projectiles were intercepted outside the country's borders with the help of the United States, and the United Kingdom, and France. Jordan also shot down some missiles aimed at Israel as they were flying through Jordanian airspace. So there is potential a lot of collateral damage when this sort of thing happens. Crossing into other nations' airspace to launch these attacks it is just... Then when things get shot down, where are they landing? So many people 
innocent people are harmed by the actions of these nations. That is just... We need to start holding them all accountable. All of them. Because if Canada and the United States had actually called out Israel for its attack on the consulate in Syria, then maybe we wouldn't be in this situation right now. Maybe Iran wouldn't feel the need to retaliate the way it has. Uh, Israel's military added that a small number of hits were identified in a base located in southern Israel. Minor damage occurred to the infrastructure. A seven-year-old girl was also severely injured by missile fragments, while other uh, patients sustained minor injuries and some were treated for anxiety. U.S. Defense Sec... <laughs> just treated for anxiety. I see the, the stories about it all the time, how anxious the people in Israel are, how they're constantly worried that they're under threat and under attack, and they have bunkers, and usually the threat for them is from Hamas. You know, they're worried about Hamas is going to launch all these attacks, and they're constantly worried. And for the most part, that's their government doing that to them, making them so hyper vigilant that they're constantly on edge. And I've also seen in social media people mocking them because of this. Not everyone in Israel is supportive of what's happening in Gaza. Lots of people are against the genocide. Lots of people are against what's happening there. And some people could be suffering anxiety because of that as well. A lot of people in Israel don't know the truth because it gets hidden from them, from their government and their social media bubbles and all that sort of stuff. It, it's easy to dismiss it because we're angry and we just want to blame people. But we have to keep in mind that in every nation, there are innocent people who are being harmed in one way or another. Even the aggressor nations, there are people in it who are innocent, who don't want the aggression to happen that are, are sucked into it just because of where they are, where they were born. And it's important to remember that it's all people in the end who suffer from this. It's all individuals, people, families that get broken up. The actual nation states themselves, the governments, they're not that hurt by this. And in some instances, it benefits them. A lot of the theories right now is that Netanyahu uh, targeted the consulate because the attack that they're doing in Gaza isn't turning out the way that he had hoped. That global pressure is now starting to mount. That he may not be able to use this as an excuse much longer. And he knows that once he's out of power, he's going to be charged. And he doesn't want to go to jail. To think that you would do a genocide and start a war for your own personal sake because you're worried you might go to jail is so gross, just monstrous in so many levels. And it is just nation states using people as pawns all over the place. It is... I'm just, I'm anti-war in general. I don't like it when any wars happen, no matter who the aggressor is or not. I just, I wish I could, you know, just snap my fingers and say bye to all wars, world peace and all that sort of stuff. But I'm not that naive. I know that there's, there's always going to be conflict as long as resources are sparse and they're running out right now. And there's people who are just greedy and want to push their views on everyone else and all that sort of stuff. So U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said Saturday that the U.S. also intercepted dozens of missiles and drones launched from Israel, launched at Israel from Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Okay, uh, so they have this graph here. Where exactly did the attacks take place during the attacks? Israel military ordered residents in northern Israel occupied Golan Heights. Occupied? <laughs> Golan Heights near Syrian and Lebanese borders and the southern cities of uh, Nevatan, Dimona, and Yilei. 
to uh, remain near bomb shelters. Let's just take a look at this picture here. We don't need to go over all of these little nuanced details. It's knowing exactly where they hit and all that sort of stuff isn't going to change the overall context of everything. Uh, so let's just see. Okay, let's get down to here. Why did Iran attack Israel? Iran's attack is in is a retaliation for a suspected Israeli strike that killed an Iranian military commander, Major General Mohammad uh, Reza Zaid, in Damac Damascus on April 1st. He was killed along with six other Iranian nationals, including another general. At least six Syrian citizens were also killed. Do we really need to play this game of, you know, well, if this had happened to an American consulate, of course they would hit back. Like, all these people that are just so quick to say, Iran is out of line, and yet we all know, we all know, that if it had been an American consulate, if it had been a British consulate, if it had been an Israeli consulate that were hit and over a dozen people killed, that they would expect a retaliation. That to not expect it is ridiculous. Of course, of course, it doesn't justify any damage. It doesn't just like there, there's... Again, it's not about taking sides. It's not about, you know, I'm on the side of Iran with this and I'm on the side of Israel with that or I'm on the side of Palestinians with this. It is just an underlying humanitarian thing with me. The least amount of suffering possible is what I want. You know, I, I don't want a genocide. I don't want a war in the Middle East. Even though personally I will not be affected, it doesn't matter to me to care about what's happening over there. Millions of people's lives are at risk if all-out war breaks out over there. And I might be safe in my little bubble here, but that doesn't stop, you know, all, all of the... That doesn't mean that there's nothing I, I can, can't do to help. I can pressure my government to stop being involved with everything that's happening, to start calling out the governments, to start doing their part in de-escalation. Because there's no such thing as isolated incidences like this anymore. It has global repercussions no matter where you are, when there's a tax this big, when it affects so many people. You know, in Canada, we have tens of thousands of Syrian refugees from their civil war. Like, it's, there's, we're no longer in a bubble, you know, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to things like climate change, we're no longer in a bubble. And to think that this won't have repercussions around the world is naive. And so it's important to stay engaged, to stay plugged into what's happening. Uh, so it seems that Iranian leaders are determined to take action, but also be seen to take action. Uh, David de Roche, an associate professor of the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., told Al Jazeera, what the what that indicates to me is that there are considerations of pride and prejudice that are divorced from strategy and tactical unity that may in, indicate a more dangerous era than we thought he added. Oh, prestige. Yeah, pride and prestige. Hezbollah, a Le Lebanese armed group backed by Iran and the Israeli military, have been trading attacks across Lebanon-Israel border since October 8th, the day after the Hamas-led attack in southern Israel and Israel's brutal retaliation on the besieged Gaza Strip. Since then, more than 330 people in Lebanon have been killed in Israeli attacks, including at least 66 civilians. Hezbollah attacks have killed at least 18 people on the Israeli side, 12 soldiers and 6 civilians. On Saturday, Iranian state media announced that the country's armed forces had seized an Israel-linked container ship near the Strait of Hormoz.
Let's see, how much longer is this? It's a pretty long article. <laughs> I don't, again, I don't think I need to go over all of this for us to kind of get the gist of what's happening. <laughs> Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country will win in a tweet after the attacks. Earlier, he spoke to the nation stating that the military was prepared for any scenario, including the ones that they caused. Like, Iran has just been hit over and over and over again, and it's really their restraint that has um, kept us out of a World War III at this point. And this is going back to when Donald Trump actually targeted one of their generals. It seems like a lifetime ago, but it wasn't that long ago, and we'll actually get a little bit into it with some of the other things that I'm covering. Uh, I'm just going to quickly take a glance in the sandbox before we get into what my government, the Canadian government, is uh, saying about this. Uh, Looney Tunes 9000, Bill Maher, the unfunny right-winger. <laughs> There is very, there, he had jokes in his segment. They weren't funny. And we'll get into all of it. Uh, Kelly Bach says that she heard that, unfortunately, the uh, seven-year-old girl died. And it's tragic, you know especially when children don't make it through these situations. Lord Foxy 13, people in the monolith, there are good Israelis. Mm -hmm. That's why I always, you know, try to stress the Israel government, the IDF. It's never Jewish people because... It's not them who are doing this. It's the Israeli government who is doing this. And to kind of lump them all together, it's not right. <sighs> okay, uh, let's just... That is not the... I put these out of order, unfortunately. Let's do that. So this statement was released yesterday, just after the attack, from Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. The Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, today issued the following statement on the attacks by Iranian regime against Israel. <sighs> on the attacks by the Iranian regime against Israel, as opposed to the retaliation. Again, so frustrating see mainstream media constantly be like the attacks that Iran is launching like they're coming out of the blue or something. Canada unequivocally condemns Iran's airborne attack against Israel. We stand with Israel. After supporting uh, Hamas's brutal October 7th attack, the Iranian regime's latest actions will further destabilize the region and make lasting peace more difficult. Yes, now everyone is saying, well, not everyone, but a lot of people on the Twitterverse that I've been seeing are saying that basically Iran deserves this because they're Hamas. That somehow they are all Hamas and they helped Hamas do the attack. And so, you know, it makes total sense why Israel would attack them now, months and months and months after the fact, because, you know, once they've killed all the Hamas in the Gaza Strip, well, then they have to kill all Hamas no matter where they are around the globe. Uh, these attacks demonstrate yet again the Iranian regime's disregard for peace and stability in the region. <laughs> like, that's, um, no, the only reason why there hasn't been an all-out war is because of their restraint so far. 
this isn't a disregard for peace and stability. Israel striking their consulate, killing their civilians, that has a lot to do with disregard for peace and stability. <laughs> we support Israel's right to defend itself and its people from these attacks. Every single goddamn statement they have to make about Hamas or Israel or anything includes this. We support Israel's right to defend itself, which is now just coded language for they can do whatever the fuck they want. Genocide? Sure, go ahead. Attacking their nation? Sure, go ahead. You know, it's all in self-defense after all. At least they didn't say, you know, well, maintaining humanitarian law or something like that, because even Canada now is saying, well, we can't really claim that Israel is, you know, following the guidelines of humanitarian law after, you know, killing so many peace workers and civilians and stuff of that sort. It's getting a little bit more difficult to claim that. The fact that, you know, it's being investigated for genocide as we speak, all that sort of stuff. And he says, I am receiving regular updates from the National Security Intelligence Advisor, the Chief of Defense Staff, and Clerk of the Privy Council as the situation develops. We are in contact with allies and we will continue to monitor closely. So that was his statement. Let's see. I wanted to get to other statements. So then there's Pierre Polyev who also has a statement on this issue. Oh, that's the French one. He had an English one too. <laughs> I thought I had clicked on the English one. Let's go back. That's the thing, they always do French and English. There we go. There's the English one, I can read this one. On behalf of the official opposition, I unequivocally condemn the brazen attacks launched on Israel by the Iranian regime. This same regime supported Hamas's heinous terrorist attack on October 7th. It coordinates and funds terror throughout the region through its uh, terrorist proxy, the IRGC, which murdered 55 Canadians by shooting down flight PS-752. Huh. So that got included in this statement. And for those of you who might not know about this or remember this, that was the Ukrainian International Airline Flight 752. And uh, it was scheduled international civilian passenger flight from Tehran to uh, Kiev operated. I, I think that's Kiev. I'm Again, names of things, especially in languages I'm not familiar with. I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, on 8 January 2020, the Boeing 737 flying the route was shot down by the Islamic Revenu Revolutionary Guard Corp. Uh, shortly after takeoff, killing all 176 occupants on board. Now, also, not saying I agree with it. But there are reasons. Missiles were fired at the aircraft by the RG, IRGC amidst heightened tensions between Iran and the United States. The incident occurred five days after the United States carried out the assassination of Soleimani and some hours after Iran retaliated with Operation Martyr Soleimani, in which the IRGC fired a dozen of ballistic missiles on American-led coalition forces, both assassination and the missile strikes took place in Iraq. Would this have happened had the United States not out of the blue, simply assassinated one of their generals. I'm not saying I agree with it. I don't. Never want this sort of thing to happen. But you have Canada, Israel, all these places constantly hitting Iran and hitting Iran and hitting Iran and then act like they're the aggressors when they fight back. Then we also have uh, Jagmeet Singh. Let's make this bigger, actually. 
leader of the NDP. I condemn the serious escalation uh, represented by Iran's attack on Israel and call for immediate cessation of these hostilities. So many innocent people have been killed in the region. This is unacceptable. Canada must do everything in its power to de-escalate the situation. My thoughts are with everyone who is worried for their loved ones tonight. Okay, so they all condemned what Iran did, but have they condemned what Israel did or anything else? Because I went back in their feed and, you know, they, they like to acknowledge certain things. Like for many, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza means the joy of Eid will not be felt the same as past years, yet the message of Eid of charity and service to those in need remains as important as ever. May this Eid al Fatar uh, bring peace and blessings to you and your loved ones. Uh, you're not really mentioning why it will not be felt the same as in the past years like what could possibly be happening to interfere with that but you still got to get out there and say that huh but in all fairness pierre polyam also wishing everyone a happy eid wishing a blessed eid al fitter to muslims in Can and in Canada and all around the world. As you celebrate the end of the holy month of Ramadan, I hope you feel a refreshed and renewed in your faith. Common sense conservatives will always stand with you and against hatred and bigotry in all its forms. <laughs> Except for, you know, the hatred and bigotry that they actually have in their hearts. <laughs> Gosh. Like, this, this is just from, like, April 9th, and here is this statement. This is just from yesterday. So, you know, April 9th, they can all get on Twitter to wish Muslims a, a blessed Eid. Despite everything that's going on there and never mentioning what's happening there. And common sense conservatives, that's going to be their catchphrase this round, which is just so frustrating and annoying because it's very inaccurate, will always stand with you against hatred and bigotry in all of its forms. You mean like a genocide in that kind of form? You, you stand against hatred and bigotry in the form of genocide? Do you? Do you? No? No? You, you don't? You don't? No, they don't. Jagmeet Singh also this Eid, I know many in the Muslim community will be thinking about their family and loved ones in Gaza and Sudan. Let me tell, let me say to you, throughout the month of Ramadan, Canadians have witnessed your generosity, but also your longing for peace. You are not alone. Many stand with you. Uh, Eid. I'm, I'm not sure how to say that word. Again, this just seems so icky that they would send out these messages in the midst of what's happening without even acknowledging what's happening. They kind of like, kind of sort of hints about it, thinking about their family and loved ones in Gaza and Sudan. Why are they thinking about their loved ones in Gaza and Sudan? Well, why? Hmm? You're not going to mention anything about that. Justin had also released because he did mention something about an attack that Israel did. My thoughts are with the family of uh, Jake, Jacob uh, Flick, Flickinger, a Canadian citizen who was among those killed in Israeli airstrike on an aid vehicle killed while delivering food to civilians in need. His death is absolutely unacceptable. Are you condemning Israel over it? Or are you just saying that it was bad that Israel made this mistake? Although he did come out at one point and say that it was a direct attack and that he's against it. So, you know, he did come out and say that. But still, at a time when humanitarian aid is so urgently needed in Gaza, again, why? Is it so needed in Gaza right now? Israel has an obligation to ensure the safety of aid workers. The world and his loved ones deserve an explanation as to how this happened. 
The best way to ensure the safety of aid workers and everyone, ceasefire. Just throwing that out there. If there was a ceasefire, you could avoid all of this. Get the aid in there. They're, they're starving to death right now. We, we could get more aid in if there was a ceasefire. <sighs> and of course there is Melanie Jolie. I'm including her because she is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada. So really involved with all this. We unequivocally condemn Iran's attack against Israel. In this difficult time, we stand with Israel, the Israeli people and Jewish communities in Canada and abroad. These unprecedented attacks from Iran will only serve to further destabilize the region. It must stop. Not unprecedented attacks. Just saying, again, retaliation for what Israel did to them. This isn't out of the blue. They didn't just decide one day, oh, we're going to do this. You know, this is... I don't know how much Iran was or if it was involved with the attack on October 7th. I don't know. But we're talking about something that happened months and months and months ago. And now, suddenly, Israel's like, oh, so we're just going to hit one of their consulates and kill some of their civilians and civilians of another country. Months and months and months after the fact. Out of the blue, they're just... Oh, now we're going to use that as an excuse to escalate things. And the agent NDN down here says, Israel kills a Canadian humanitarian delivering aid and bombs a Canadian embassy. And you uh, salvage captured Zionist ding-dongs can't do anything but say, we stand by Israel. So what is he talking about here? Canadian embassy in Syria damaged an Israeli strike on Iranian embassy next door. Huh. So when Israel attacked the consulate in Syria and killed Iranian officials and other innocent people, we, Canada, has an embassy there that was also damaged in this attack. And I'm calling this one an attack because this one wasn't retaliation. It was an attack. Uh, Canadian embassy ceased operation in 2012 as Syrian civil war worsened. So... You know, in all fairness, no Canadians were potentially there. It's But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we uh, scroll down. An Israeli embassy spokesperson declined to say whether Israel had warned Canada in advance of the airstrike. So the thing is, and here, but on Wednesday, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie told reporters that Canada was not warned in advance. So even though it hasn't been in operation since 2012, Canadians still use it for reasons when they're in the area. It's not like it's an empty building all the time. So there was a good chance that there could have been Canadians in it. Yeah, and the GAC didn't say whether Israel checked with Canada to ensure that no Canadian personnel were on the site when the airstrike hit. And the GCA is the uh, Global Affairs Canada. So, <laughs> Israel targeted an aid convoy which killed a Canadian citizen, Canadian U.S. dual citizen. Israel then also attacked a consulate in Syria, which damaged our embassy, which is, you know, th how this works is that is considered Canadian soil. They, they launched an attack that, you know, basically on Canadian soil or the closest that you would get to it. And Canada is still condemning Iraq, Iran for hitting back and not condemning Israel for what it's done. Came close, 
to the, the convoy and the humanitarian aid worker, you know, Justin Trudeau came close to saying, like, outright condemnation. But still, despite all of this, Israel is just seems to be allowed to get away with so much. And all the blame is always put on all the other nation states. Like, again, it's kind of like Hamas didn't attack out of the blue. Again, do I really have to put that disclaimer there that I don't agree with what they did? You know, they killed civilians. I'm not a fan of that. They're a horrible regime. They're, they're, they treat people poorly and horrifically and all that sort of stuff. Like, do I need to say that every time? But then also acknowledge that there were reasons why they did that attack. You know, it wasn't out of the blue. It's because of what Israel has been doing to them for the past, I don't know, 78 odd years. So there was another statement released today that I have not read yet. I spoke with uh, G7 leaders earlier on the strike and carried out overnight by the Islamic Republic of Iran against Israel are statements. So Justin Trudeau has released another statement after talking to the members of the G7. We, the leaders of the G7, unequivocally condemn in the strongest terms Iran's direct and unprecedented attack against Israel. Again, not unprecedented. It was a retaliation for what Israel did to them. Not only them, but, you know, what Israel did to, to Canada. You might want to mention that, Justin. Iran fired hundreds of drones and missiles towards Israel. Israel, with the help of its partners, defeated the attack. I also think it's very sad, the amount of people that saying that Iran's attack on Israel was disproportionate to what happened. I've seen that floating around, that it was disproportionate. The hundreds and hundreds of bombs and strikes and drones was very disproportionate to what Israel did to them. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like the October 7th Hamas attack. And then, you know, maybe the genocide, bit of a disproportionate response to that. Just saying that that's a very disproportionate response to what happened on October 7th. Yeah, nobody seems to complain about that one. We express our full solidarity and support to Israel and its people and reaffirm our commitment towards its security. Oh, I haven't read further, but who wants to bet that somewhere in here there's, we believe in Israel's right to defend itself. Let's see. With its actions, Iran has further stepped towards the destabilization of the region and risk provoking uncontrollable region, regional escalation. That's not Iran provoking that. That was Israel provoking that. This must be avoided. We will continue to to work to stabilize the situation and avoid further escalation. You can do that by calling for a ceasefire and stop selling weapons to Israel and stop sending them money. In this spirit, we demand that Iran and its proxies cease their attack and we stand ready to take further measures now and in response to further destabilization initiatives. Hmm. Okay. We will also strengthen our cooperation in this crisis, including continuing to work towards an immediate and sustainable ceasefire release button. Okay, so they didn't say it, but they said ceasefire and the release of the hostages by Hamas and deliver increased humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in need. Okay, so they didn't say Israel has a right to defend itself here, but they did have to throw in release of hostages by Hamas without, again, mentioning all of the Palestinians that Israel has locked up that could be called hostages. They were kidnapped locked up for no reason whatsoever, just thrown behind bars because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, or they had a rock or something of that sort. They, they were a threat somehow and were just rounded up and put in prison for years and years and years. 
And the conditions in those prisons are so horrendous right now that they're saying amputations are starting to happen because of how tightly the handcuffs have been on them and for the length of time. Like, this is a real thing, but nobody ever talks about releasing those hostages. Only the hostages that Hamas has. <sighs> really, it's so frustrating. So frustrating we have to go through this all the time. It was not an unprecedented attack against Israel. There were reasons. <sighs> and then we have here this tweet from Mehdi Hassan just saying yes. And what is he saying yes to? If we go back a couple quote tweets, as Israel is under attack from Iran, we stand with Israel and its people and the United States will do everything we can to support Israel's defense against Iran. And somebody quote tweeting Chuck Schumer here, uh, Khalid, uh, saying, is everyone seriously going to pretend that all of this isn't a direct result of Israel bombing an embassy in the capital of another sovereign state? To which Mehdi is saying, yes. You know, this, a lot of people are going to pretend that this isn't a direct result of Israel bombing an embassy in the capital of another sovereign state. They're going to pretend that this was just out of the blue, that Iran had, had nothing better to do and just sent over hundreds and hundreds of bombs and drones and all that sort of stuff. Out of the blue. Just out of the blue. And Mehdi is also pointing out from the archive worth a, a reread. <laughs> Let me start that over. Mehdi Hassan also tweeting out from the archive worth rereading today. Trump's erratic, and this is from Joe Biden in 2019. Trump's erratic impulsive actions are the last thing we need as commander in chief. No president should order a military strike without the full, without fully understanding the consequences. We don't need another war in the Middle East, but Trump's actions towards Iran only make that more likely. Yes, please keep that in mind in the near future. Again, I've seen some headlines saying that Joe Biden will not support Israel in a full-out assault of Iran, but we don't know. We, we A lot of these headlines we can't trust yet because everything is still too new. Everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. We don't know the details. And from Matt Lieb, just kind of pointing out this Zionist here saying, this is just like 10-7. We didn't think Hamas would be so crazy because it knew what would follow. Turns out it, turns out it was. It's Iranian world warlord patrons are no different. And uh, Matt Lieb just kind of pointing out, when you accidentally admit that 10-7 was retaliation for Israel's acts of war. Yeah, you got to be careful with those comparisons there. You might out yourself as, you know, being the cause of these attacks in the first place. Let's see. And here we have breaking. Israel calls for emergency meeting of the UN Security Council. And it's like, thought the UN was Hamas, but okay, because everyone was calling the UN Hamas for not fully getting behind Israel and its assault and genocide. Because basically anything that wasn't fully supporting Israel was Hamas, including the UN. But now, now that things might be escalating in a way that Israel doesn't really want to happen, necessarily, well, now they can go to the UN Security Council. And Ben Dixon also <laughs> putting this out. Someone explain it to me like I'm a PhD in international security. Oh, someone explain it to me like a PhD in international security, how Israel striking Iran didn't start World War III, but Iran retaliating does. Yeah. Yeah. So far, the only thing that hasn't caused World War III is Iran's restraint. And part of that is because Iran knows if 
full-out war were to happen there, they're not going to win. They know that. They're not naive to think that they have a chance of surviving through that. So they're not eager to actually start World War III, but they also don't want to be attacked over and over and over again. You know, they have to retaliate at some point. Otherwise, what? They'll just keep on getting bombed and hit and any excuse made to do this? We need our world leaders to step up and really start condemning Israel for what they're doing. The genocide. The attacks on other nations. The attacks on Canadians. Because I, I guarantee you there's a lot of Canadians in the Gaza Strip who haven't made it. What about those citizens? Because Canada seems to care a whole lot more about them than they do about, you know, all the other Palestinians that are trapped in that situation. It's absolutely a horrific thing. And I know, like on Twitter, it's trending World War Three, and everyone is anxious and worried. And just remember, we've been in this place before. We've been under this threat before. And... There are rational heads out there that are keeping cool, that are de-escalating, that are trying to make sure this doesn't escalate further into a war. And I know it can cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, but this is where you kind of have to just try to stay in the moment. Do everything we can now to call out the actions of our government. But until it happens, just try to stay in the moment. It might not happen. It might, it might not. But until it happens, we have to stay focused on what we can do now. How we can pressure our government now. And do everything we can to make sure it doesn't escalate. I think so many people just want to see the world burn at this point. They don't care how. And it's important that we all just kind of stay in the moment. <sighs> Let's uh, check the sandbox, shall we? Lightning Rod, I think human rights will get eclipsed by a changed climate. It's definitely going to be stirring up a lot of the uh, global politics. You know, when you have climate refugees ranging in the millions trying to get into other countries. Because already refugees are not looked too fondly upon. But when parts of the world become absolutely unlivable, it's only going to get worse. Let's see. Hunger Games 1989. Bill Maher has funny jokes. No, not really. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. Not since about 1989, anyway. <sighs> Hunger Games also saying John Fetterman's statement was horseshit. I haven't seen it. I I don't I don't need to see it to know. Zionist bullshit. His whole turn towards Israel and and being full fledged Zionist so disappointing, and just how eager he seems to, you know, have Israel actually commit this genocide. It's it's gross. <sighs> Looney Tunes 9000 no we do not stand with Israel we stand, stand with Palestinians let Israel pay for their actions 
it's I stand with people and I want the Israeli government to pay for their actions I want Netanyahu to pay for their actions but again keep in mind there's a lot of innocent people in Israel who want no part of this who are against the genocide who will also suffer if you know a full out attack against Israel happens and that's the thing like Israel has done it to itself for the most part. The Jewish people there are not safe because of the action of their state. They're making their state a target and all the innocent people within will also be targeted. And yes, I know there's a lot of Jewish people within Israel who are the settlers, who are horrible people as well, but there are still a lot of innocent people there. It's not a monolith. It's never a monolith. And I also fall into this weird category of, I don't think, you know, the consequence for every bad action should be death. <laughs> it's... Uh... Lightning rod, when was it ever peaceful? I think talking about how long the conflict has been going on in that area. And it's, yeah, it's been a long, long time. I don't know the full history of it, but you don't need to be a scholar to see where the balance of power is now and who's in the wrong at this moment. Generally speaking, it's the country committing genocide that is in the wrong. Kelly Bach, my family is from Lebanon, and it was peaceful until the war in the 70s. Not sure about elsewhere, but many of my family left to get away from the war. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> lots and lots of, and it's just important that we stay in the moment. It's not World War Three right now, and it might not get there. And it's important to take everything you hear right now with a grain of salt. We don't know what's happening. Everything you see online you, you can't necessarily trust, like even from Al Jazeera, take that with a huge grain of salt. Because I know, especially with American media outlets, it's not like it's uncommon for them to hear a right wing talking point that has no basis in reality and go with it. So it, it's important to just remain cautious of the information that we hear right now, the whole fog of war thing. And it's something that I've been stressing no matter what side has, has claimed the atrocity, we won't know how bad all of this is until the dust settles. And the sooner that happens, the better. It's, it's just, I can't imagine what it's like for the people over there right now, in the Gaza Strip, what they're going through. It is just, it's a man-made disaster. None of it had to happen, but this is in large part Israel's actions and Canada and the United States and other countries just allowing it to, because we have the power to stop it, but we haven't. Yeah. Huh. It's a bit dry in here. Oh, so that was one big news story that happened in the past uh, 24, 48 hours. Then something else that popped into my news feed. Bill Maher talking smack about Canada. Again, 
I don't mind when other countries talk smack about Canada. I talk smack about Canada all the time. I'm not one of those people that say, like, unless you know everything about it, you can't say comment on it, you don't know anything about Canada, how dare you? Because, let's face it, Canadians talk smack about the United States all the time. It's very easy to, actually. You guys make it so easy for us to talk smack about you. <laughs> so I don't, I don't fall into that camp of, like, outsiders aren't allowed to comment on the happenings in Canada. And in fact, it'd be nice if more countries did, because then that would actually maybe bring attention to what's happening here in Canada. What I don't like is when the information is everything from misleading to false, like just outright not real. Or right wing talking points or things that have been debunked. And I watched that segment from Bill Maher and let's just say... He, he doesn't, it wasn't accurate what he was saying. And the information he was laying out was also very misleading. There were some slivers of truth in what he had to say. But even then, it's like, uh, I don't know, I don't know. So I don't think I can play the video because I would most likely get a copyright strike. So I've done something a little different and you're going to have to bear with me on this, but I have prepared for everyone a slideshow. I've taken screen grabs with the uh, text on it and we're going to go over those <laughs> and we're going to debunk them as we go along or, or comment on them. And so I have a, a different setup for that. So please bear with me as we do this. I don't know how well it's going to play out. And I hope that even by this, I don't get a copyright strike. I don't know if it would work on just screen grabs of the actual video. But we'll find out. <laughs> Unfortunately, we'll find. I might find out the hard way. I'm not allowed to do this either. So we're going to have to, you know we'll see how this plays out and just be patient with me because I have to switch back and forth between screens and all that sort of stuff. So let's get ready for a slideshow. Where is it? Here we go. See, look at that. Look at that. The first screen grab that I got. So Bill Maher through this whole thing is basically just talking about how Canada is not a paradise, how we're not a socialist utopia and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, gee, I could have told you that. <laughs> but he goes out of his way to, to point out certain things and he misses a lot of nuance, a lot of context, and he also misses a lot of humor. <laughs> There's not much funny in this. Like when I say not much, I mean nothing. He, he makes reference to a poutine, of course, of course. Because the only time I joke about Canada and poutines, I'm basically doing it in an ironic way in such that I'm acknowledging it's overdone, that kind of joke. But, you know, it, it, is, it is what it is. And, uh, yeah, he's so smug about everything he says here. But, again, a lot of this information isn't necessarily accurate and a lot of it is nuanced. So let's get into it. So here he's pointing out the unemployment rate in Canada and the USA. I never pay too much attention to the unemployment rate itself because that does not mean that you have a healthy economy. That does not mean that people aren't struggling to get by. A lot of people are underemployed. A lot of people have jobs, but those jobs don't come close to meeting their needs. So you can have a higher unemployment rate, but or a lower unemployment rate, but the quality of jobs that people have are horrific. Now, also in Canada, we have a little bit more freedom to have a little bit of a higher unemployment rate. Because even though he does pick on our healthcare system a lot, and I pick on our healthcare system a lot, we still have a healthcare system that is superior to the United States in that a lot of people, their, their healthcare is not tied to their employment. 
so a lot of this 3.8 that you're saying seeing there are people who are forced to work in jobs they can't handle that might actually be making them sick because they have no choice because of the the risk of losing their health insurance because here in Canada we have a few more safety nets so it, it is you can have a slightly higher unemployment rate and it not be absolutely devastating to the people so all throughout this he misses that type of nuance and I felt the need to basically fact check everything that he was saying with this so if I go to this other screen here that you guys shouldn't see as I'm doing this. Is this the one that I want? Yes, this is the one I want. Now you should still, okay, yeah, you're still seeing the, the, this screen with the, the graph on there. And so I did some fat checking. And if we go to, to here, ooh, look at that smooth transition there. So unemployment rate in Canada current is 6.1%. So he was right. Basic info, uh, Canada employment rate is at 6.1% compared to 5.8% last month and 5.10% last year. This is the this is lower than the long-term average of 8.05. So again, nuance. Yes, it's higher than the United States. It's also lower than average. Than the long-term average. So it's gone down a bit and keep in mind, unemployment shot up during COVID. Like a lot of these, a lot of the things that we're getting into with what he covers have been affected by a global pandemic. <laughs> Had a little bit of an effect on things like employment and healthcare and housing and all this sort of stuff that we're going to get into. And the unemployment in the United States 3.7 to 3.9%. The unemployment rate has been in a narrow range of this since August 2023. Among the major worker groups, the unemployment rate for, and then it just breaks it down by race, of course. So we have that. And then if I go back to here, ooh, look at that smooth transition. So Again, this that he's pointing out to make Canada seem like it's a horrible place, because even though he says throughout this, it's like, oh, but I love Canada and I'm not trying to make you guys look bad. Yes, he is. Like, yes, he is. And he's trying to make us look bad for his own agenda of the left has gone too far and look what it's done. And that is why he's attacking Canada the way he is. It's not because he actually cares about the people here. And so the next thing we have here that he wanted to point out was North America cities with the worst air pollution. And look at that. So it's the same world map as this one that they just kind of photoshopped on top of. Where's the source? I don't see a source here. Like even with this, this one that you see here with the unemployment, there is no source. I Googled it and that's what I came up with. But where is he getting this information from? Well, I have an idea of where some of this information is coming from. And again, it's a very nuanced thing if you look into it. Because here you just say, Oh, North American cities with the worst air pollution, you know, that must mean that Canada is horrible polluter and all this sort of stuff and blah, blah, blah. And we do have problems with pollution, especially in, you know, this area here called Alberta uh, with the tar sands and things of that sort. It's not like we're innocent of that. But if we go here and we go here and I do this. Canada had North America's worst air quality in 2023 because of wildfires, report says. Oh, right. Remember that happened? That there was a massive outbreak of wildfires in Canada last year that just caused air pollution to go berserk, even affecting people as far away as New York. You know, it looked like Blade Runner there. I actually talked a bit about this in my last live stream about the wildfires that were happening. 
because here's the thing. If you go to this nifty website right here, air pollution in North America, real time air quality index. This is real time right now, real time, like with Bill Maher. So it, it's a weird website. It doesn't kind of load up properly. So under here you have health alert, everyone may experience. So basically the darker red is, is bad. And there's actually an area right here, right there. That's, that's in America that is like purple and purple is, you know, very unhealthy. I don't think I see any of these kind of like, oh, no, is that one? Is, is 185 not unhealthy? So all of these kind of like little red areas here, unhealthy, unhealthy, you know, they, they all seem to kind of be, uh, in America. Oh, and then there's some down here in Mexico. Um, Oh, use control. Wait, I'm trying to scroll. Use con uh, control. Oh, here we go. Let's do that. There we go. There we go. So, oh, wow. There's so many little dots on this. <laughs> Oops. Ah, no, I wanted to go over here. So here we see we got a purple, very unhealthy, and then behind it and trying to to get to the behind it part because that looked like it might be like a dark red there we go no nope, still not getting on of it oh, almost <sighs> yeah <laughs> this is a very detailed map it has like so much stuff on it and if you notice something right now Canada is in a much better situation than the United States when it comes to air quality and this is a real-time air quality index so this is right now versus if you go back to 2023 because of wildfires causing a lot of pollution in Canada so for Bill Maher to point that out without this context it matters this makes a huge difference because if you just say air pollution without that context you might actually think of like polluters like industry polluting and all that sort of stuff and cars and whatnot as opposed to you know a massive outbreak of wildfires so this this map that he has is very not accurate and I actually wanted to play a bit because again I covered this briefly in my last live stream because here in Ontario Doug Ford is spending a hundred million less on emergency firefighting even though this upcoming year it's predicted to be even worse than last year when it comes to firefighting or to forest fires so I just want to play this kind of in relation to this with above normal temperatures expected this spring, persistent drought, and a relatively dry winter, Canada may be in for a repeat of last year's wildfire season. Emergency Preparedness Minister Harjeet Sajjan says the risk is already there. With the heat and dryness across the country, we can expect that the wildfire season will start sooner and end later and potentially be more explosive. In 2023, Canada saw millions of hectares of land burned and hundreds of thousands evacuated in what has become the most destructive wildfire season on record. This year, forecasters say conditions are ripe for early and above normal fire risk from British Columbia to Quebec in both April and May. Though some forecasts remain unclear, such as long-range precipitation. It is impossible to predict with certainty that the summer, the summer that lies ahead of us. But what is clear is that wildfires will, will represent a significant challenge for Canada into the future. Sajjan added the impacts of climate change, like longer fire seasons, continue to cost Canadians. The federal government says they're already preparing, from equipping provinces and territories with wildfire fighting tools to training firefighters. Climate adaptation expert Annabella Bonata says that early preparation is key. That, to me, is just such a big sign of a, of a change in our thinking of, of preparing ahead of time and not just waiting for the catastrophe to occur. Though officials note lightning can be the main source of wildfires in the summer, most spring fires are started by people accidentally, whether from careless burning, campfires, or even heat from off-road vehicles sparking grass or other debris. A really, really small situation can lead to a very large fire, so there's so much that we can do just to protect ourselves and each other from starting a fire. Whether it's cutting back tree branches and removing dry debris from around your home, to 
to having an emergency kit and evacuation plans in place. There are things each Canadian can do to prepare for another potentially active fire season. Sean Travel, Global News. Yeah, so wildfires, big reason why this might be, uh, why this graph here uh, might be what you're seeing. So we have the unemployment, we have North American cities with worse air pollution. Now, since he's not citing a source, it's hard for us to know if what this is in relation to. So from what I can tell currently, it's because of the forest fires we had last year. But everything currently suggests that air pollution in the United States is worse than here in Canada. Next one. So now we get into some of the little titles here so I can read. So he's saying in his little monologue, Canada was where all the treasured goals of liberalism worked perfectly. Canada was where all the treasured goals of liberalism worked perfectly. Um, it's, it's never been like that in Canada. Never. It, it's... When you say Canada is socialist, we have socialist programs, but Canada is not a socialist state. And nothing here has ever worked perfectly. So here he is saying last year, Canada added 1.3 million people, which is a lot. And it is a lot. And I have no idea where he got this number from. No idea. I, I, I googled all around for it. Um, ah, you see that when I do that, huh? Okay, I have to be a little bit more quick with that, I guess. I'm trying to do this smoothly. <laughs> uh, da -da -da -da. As you can see, I have a gazillion tabs open right now. So here, if we do this, this was the highest proportion. So this was the highest proportion since Confederation, topping the previous record of 22.3% in 1921, the largest proportion among G7 countries, just over 1.3 million new immigrants. Okay, so we got that 1.3 number. 1.3 million immigrants settled permanently in Canada from 2016 to 2021 the highest number of recent immigrants recorded in Canada's census. Oh, okay. So that's over um, about a five year span, not one year. Although, although you go here, this is the annual report to parliament on immigration. So if we scooch down to this purple highlighted part here, let's see if I can make this bigger. Over 437,000 new permanent residents, along with over 604,000 temporary workers, were admitted and helped to fill job vacancies in healthcare, the trades, technology sector, and helped rebalance our country's aging population. Okay, so now we get into again nuance. What does Bill Maher mean when we talk about? immigration. Is he talking about permanent residents or temporary workers? Because he gets into a lot of the housing and the housing issues and stuff of that sort. Temporary workers aren't the main problem for housing. Rent prices, there's an issue there and, and how that affects rent prices, but temporary workers aren't buying homes here in Canada. And while a spike in people moving to Canada is an issue with housing, it is not the sole issue with housing. And like I said, we'll get into that in a moment because he does. So we have this here. So this, again, is a little handy little graph to see. Oh, so it, it really the permanent. So if we look at permanent residents, that hasn't changed that much. But non-permanent residents skyrocketed. 
to bring us up to over a million, but still not 1.3. Again, I don't know where he got that 1.3 number from. And this is also projected to go way down because the government is cracking down on that. Because it was too many people all at once. So Canada's population boomed by 430k over 33 months. What's behind the spike? And this is from Global News. Canada came close to breaking the highest population growth rate in the quarter since July to September when it reported 400 30,635 new residents in the country. So in such a small period of time, that is a huge number. Uh, Statistic Canada reported Tuesday the population increase, which reflected the 1.1% growth rate in the third quarter of 2023. That was the highest population growth rate since the second quarter of 1957, when Canada's population grew by 198,000 people or by 1.2%. Back then, the rapid growth of population was tied to post-war baby boom and high immigration of refugees following Hungarian Revolution of 1956. And this article is also fairly recent too, just December of last year. Today, the vast majority of the population growth is due to international migration, an issue that is being tied to Canada's ongoing housing crisis in the country the country is trying to solve. Again, not the sole issue, but it is an issue. However, as what Bill Maher does, he makes it sound like it is the only issue. And when you make it sound like immigration is the only reason why the housing crisis is the way it is, then that is racist. Because it, it, it has a lot more to do with than just that. It is a contributing factor. There's no doubt about it. But it's not the only reason we have this housing crisis. This jump in our in demographic demand coupled with existing structural supply issues could explain why rent inflation continues to climb. In Canada, Bank of Canada Deputy General uh, Tony said earlier this month, it also helps to explain in part why housing prices have not fallen as much as we had expected. So, again, it's, he misses the nuance I'm not entirely sure where he got that actual number from. And he doesn't distinguish between permanent residents and temporary residents. He he kind of lumps them all together, but there there is a difference. <laughs> um, so if we get down to this part of the article. Oh, that's really tiny on the screen. Just a second. Immigration housing crisis being linked. The level of immigration in Canada and Ottawa's ambitions have been tied to the ongoing housing crisis. The minority liberals have aggressively increased their immigration targets over the past several years and surpassed records for the number of permanent residents admitted in year in both 2021 and 2022. From January to September, immigration reached 300 over close to 400,000 of immigration refugees and citizenship Canada's target of uh, 465,000 immigrants for the year, Statistic Canada said on Tuesday. In November, Immigration Minister Mark Miller introduced new targets for the next three years, which called for the number of new permanent residents to be held hold steady at 500,000 in 2026. The plan shows that the targets for 2024 and 2025 will increase as planned to 485,000 and 500,000 respectively. These immigration levels will help set the pace of Canada's economic and population growth while moderating its impact on critical systems such as infrastructure and housing. Okay, so all of that. Again, there is a sliver of truth to what he is saying on this. There is a sliver of truth, but it's not accurate when you start breaking it down by what you mean permanent residents or temporary workers like it's temporary workers it's also students it's also uh, people with emergency visas from like Ukraine we admitted a lot of people with emergency visas from Ukraine and they those are temporary emergency visas basically once 
things have settled down there, they're expected to go back. And a lot of the people that are coming over on those visas and things of that sort, they're coming and moving in with family that already exist here. So again, it does contribute to the housing crisis, but it's not the only reason why we have a housing crisis. It's a very complex issue and no one factor is responsible for it. Because now he's saying, so last year, Canada added 1.3 million people, which is a lot. And now they're experiencing a housing crisis even worse than ours. Our housing crisis is worse than ours, than the Americans. And it's been going on for a while. <laughs> like even before this spike in um, people coming over to Canada, this has been ongoing for a while. And again, very, very complex issue. And he says, and we're sleeping in tents. Uh, we have tent encampments here in Canada too. It, it, it's, it, it's bad on both sides of the border. And in my videos, I have been honest about it. And I have said over and over again, our housing crisis is worse than what's happening in the United States. So here he has this graphic here from the Fraser Institute, only, is it? <laughs> we'll get to it. So he says the medium home, so in this little graph he has here, and he says it out loud at one point, the medium home value in the United States is around 346000 The average price of a home in Canada, once it's a much higher number, but what's once converted into American dollars is 487,000 in US dollars. Where is he getting these from? Okay, well, I found something. Uh, so if we go here and we go, I'm trying to make this a little bit faster so you don't see the little bubbles popping up there. This Yahoo article. <laughs> <laughs> is where he got those numbers from. So these are the same numbers that you saw on that graph. So 346,000 and the 487,000. Uh, Here's the thing though, this isn't comparable. What's happening here? Do you notice something in, in the language here? America's medium home value, Canada's average home price. Medium and average are not the same thing. Th those are two different things. And so this one, the information is according to Zillow which I do not have access to because you need to like log in and all that sort of stuff. And down here, this is uh, from a different organization. Do I have that up here? Yes. Uh, Canada's Personal Finance Encyclopedia is where that's from. So they're citing two different sources who might measure these differently. And one is using a medium household uh, value versus an average household price. Two, 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 those are different things. So if we go here, oh, that's super tiny. Sorry. Let me make that bigger. Average house price by state in 2023. The average house price dropped at the end of 2023, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. The medium home sales price is 417,000 down from 17,000 the previous year. Uh, house prices quickly grew from the mid 2021 through late 2022. The market has started to cool off. The medium home sales price in the United States declined uh, in three out of four quarters. So here's the problem with going by different organizations too. What time periods are we comparing? Is this the same time period that we're comparing? Or are these two different time periods? Because this is a lot higher than what Bill Maher was saying. Uh, let's see. 
So the medium home price sales in the United States is 417,000 as of the fourth quarter of 2023, that's down 4%. So the average cost of a house in the United States has increased over the past four decades. Here's a look at all that sort of stuff. So we have this, which is in contrast. So basically just going by this one, we have Zillow and then we have this one, the Canada's personal finance encyclopedia. And if you go down here, this is average sold price and it's a one month change so it's literally changing month by month you're not seeing an average like over a long period of time here and housing prices again it is more expensive here in canada i'm not denying that but i don't think the gap is quite as large as he makes it seem like i i i don't think it's as big as he's making it out to be just given that we're not using comparable sources, we're not using necessarily the same ways of determining what the house prices are. <laughs> you know? Uh... So... <laughs> Uh, and I didn't find anything about the Fraser Institute. I don't even, I don't know much about the Fraser Institute. I've glanced in the sandbox about it and um, people are saying it's a right wing thing. I have zero knowledge about what the Fraser Institute is. So here he says the country has the highest household um, debt as a share of a GB. GDP in the G7s and 75% of it is from mortgages. And he says to that, I don't know what that means, but it sounds bad. Okay, it's not great, but why is this funny? Why are you talking about something if you have no clue what you're talking about, what this means? Why include that then? Because if we go over here, and go over here. So Canada has highest household debt level in G7, CMHC, Deputy Chief Economics. So again, sliver of truth. This is a real thing. Uh, and this is from May of last year. Canada has the highest level of household debt in the G7, making its economy vulnerable to a global economic crisis, according to the country's housing agency. So this is tied to the housing crisis we have here in Canada. In an analysis published Tuesday, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corp. Uh, Deputy Chief Economics um, Aleb said that the country's household debt has been rising exorbitantly due to rising home prices. Mortgages currently make up about three quarters of household debt in Canada, while household debt made up 80% of the size of the overall Canadian economy during the 2008 recession. It rose to 95% in 2010 and exceeded its size in 2021, he noted. By contrast, household debt in the United States fell from 100% of GDP in 2008 to about 75% in 2021, he wrote. While U.S. household reduced debt, Canadians increased theirs, and this will likely continue to increase unless we address affordability in the housing market. Now, for those of you who are paying attention to Canadian stuff right now, a budget is about to be read in the House of Commons from Justin Trudeau. It's all about housing. That is all he's been talking about. He, he's housing plan after housing plan after housing plan is being addressed in it. The thing is, is again, Bill Maher just tries to say that this is all a leftist problem, that it's because of the socialism. It's because of the leftism. When a lot of this has to do with conservative run provinces 
blocking anything that would actually help. You know, we have a fight between conservative provinces and the liberal federal government, preventing a lot of these problems from being solved and actually making them a whole hell of a lot worse. This isn't a liberal problem. Like, they helped, no doubt about it. Neoliberal policies way back when, but the conservatives have exacerbated the situation so much more. Uh, let's see. If we need to go over much more of this. What's that one there? Yeah, we'll get to that one. Uh, let's see. One way to reduce risk. Let's we're doing. I'm always trying to find like what are the important parts of the article to point out, but I also want to keep it in context, unlike other people. <laughs> and it's like I can read all of these ahead of time, and then it just kind of gets washed as I'm trying to present it for everyone. Uh, when many households in an economy are heavily indebted, the situation can quickly deteriorate, such as what was witnessed in the U.S. in the 2007-2008, he wrote. So, you know, this this having this debt isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, but when it's on the cusp the way it is, with the collapse looming, then it is very dangerous. <laughs> Canada is safeguarded by a sound institutional framework and prudent financial regulation. This ensures that most Canadian borrowers would be able to withstand current elevated mortgage rates. But in the event of a severe global economic downturn, Canada's high household debt will be a vulnerability. One way to reduce risk, according to the CMHC, is to improve housing affordability in Canada either through increasing housing supply or renovating and rebuilding the country's rental stock to be modern and attractive in order to prevent Canadians from feeling compelled to be homeowners. <coughs> so again, uh, Justin Trudeau, right now, the new budget, it's all about housing. Most likely going to leave people with disabilities out to dry again. Huh. <laughs> A recent report from RBC Economics stated that looming recession and unemployment rate projected to climb to 6.6% by early 2024, well, it didn't climb quite that high, are set to tip more Canadians into loan de delinquency and insolvencies. The report stated with pandemic-related government support measures largely over and living costs now soaring, mortgage delinquency could rise by more than a third of current levels over the coming year. Consumer insolvencies could increase almost 30% over the next three years, returning to pre-pandemic levels and likely remaining on an upward tra trajectory after that, RBC suggested. This report by the Canadian Press was first published in May 23, 2023. So again, our kernels of truth in what he was saying there. That is not the screen I want. I want this screen. There we go. I gotta, gotta be better at that. <sighs> oh, okay. And then if I do this, then you don't see... Oh, I haven't been switching back and forth properly. Still getting the hang of this. So this should work out better when I'm transitioning now in the future. So then we go to the next one. And here he has uh, Canada ranked last in primary health care access, ranked last in its ability to get the same or next day appointment. And he also says that's not for a lack of spending. Believe it or not, I also covered this in a live stream not too long ago. Kernels of truth. If we do the transitions like this, it looks a lot better. There we go. Oh, let's make this bigger. So Yahoo News here. They seem to be relying a lot on Yahoo News. I, I, I don't tend to rely a lot on Yahoo News, so I have no idea if this is just an aggregate. Well, it looks like it's just an aggregate of different information, as opposed to just going directly to sources. So Canada ranked last in primary healthcare access among 10 wealthy countries report. And so he was saying, 
ranked last in its ability to get same or next day appointment. So Canada ranks last in primary health care access. What he does not mention is we're talking about out of 10 wealthy countries. We're not talking about much more than that. <laughs> like it's, it's among these 10 that we, we rank the bottom. But this Canada ranks last in primary health care access is very vague. And I'll show you what I was, uh, the article I actually referenced when I was talking about this is this one right here from CTV News, how Canada's family doctor stores compares to other countries. And if we scooch down here, so we got the Netherlands. So this is um, down here. The survey ranked the following countries based on percentages of people who reported having a regular doctor or a place they can usually visit for medical care. So here we're talking about family doctors and access to family doctors. And if you look down here, Canada is at 86% and we're at the bottom of these 10 countries. And where's the United States? Just right above us. And I made a stink about that too in my video that America is actually doing better than us in this one category by one percentage point. One. And a big difference is I don't have to pay to see my family doctor if I don't have health insurance. Again, our, our wait times are getting horrendous. Our access to family doctors is getting bad, but it's again, not exactly comparable to what's happening in the United States. Cause here in Canada, if you don't have a family doctor, you can still go to a walk-in clinic. You can still go to eMERGE and still be seen. And it's still not cost you anything. Okay, you don't need to be stuck on a family doctor because of an insurance plan. And despite the spending, so despite high spending, Canada's health care system is failing badly, says the Fraser Institute. I actually found this article that they were referencing. And here of the 30 countries with universal insurance coverage, uh, Canada ranked the highest spender on healthcare as a share of its economy, 13.3%, and the eighth highest on pre per, on per person basis after adjusting for age. However, despite this spending, Canada's performance was middling to poor. Our healthcare dollars simply weren't translating into resources in a timely care. Again, here, nuance matters. No doctor, no, and this is from uh, Sherry on Twitter. No doctor, no ER open, paying for tests. This is why the provinces are stealing from us. In Ontario, some of it is going to a spa. The provinces, and who runs these provinces right now? Oh, right, conservative governments. And so this is from a GT Lem who says 70 billion in health transfers are not being spent on health care by provinces. Federal transfers for health. One thing somebody should ask the provinces before they come back for more is what did they do with the money they were given the last time around? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what happened. The, the, since 2000, uh, federal transfers for health care have more than quadrupled. Uh, provincial spending on health care has only tripled, only tripled. Uh, if the provinces were spending all the money that they got from the feds, they'd be spending about $70, $70 billion more than they are. So what did they do with that $70 billion? They didn't well, put it to other purposes. One thing somebody should ask. So the money is going towards the health care, but is it actually going towards the health care? No, no, I'm in the right screen. Okay. Um, I covered this when it happened because I was really annoyed by it. $4.4 in COVID funding for Ontario just disappeared. There's no accounting for what happened to that money. So if we're talking about spending on health care, we're including those numbers like the $4.4 billion that just kind of went nowhere that's not being spent on our health care. And that is a problem of the conservative premiers doing this. They're the ones dismantling our health care. They're the ones 
not using the money appropriately. Now, again, this is a federal and a provincial issue. The federal government should be cracking down on this. The federal government has ways to make sure that the money spent on health care is actually going towards publicly funded health care as opposed to being funneled off into private practices. So this isn't a leftist or a liberal or a socialist problem. It's the lack of it that is the problem. It's the conservatives purposely dismantling our health care system in hopes of privatizing it to look something a lot more similar to what's happening in the States. This, again, is very uh, <laughs> misleading in what it is. And again, it's ranked last in its ability to get same or next day appointment with the family doctor. And when we're talking about family doctors, the United States, you're just one percentage point above us. That, that's not exactly huge margins we're talking about here. <sighs> Just going quickly uh, look into the sandbox. There's still a lot more to go over with this, but I, I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Let's do this. Huh, it's getting darker in here. Let's do this. I'm doing these live streams now when the sun is setting. <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, Bill Williamson? Yeah, Canada is the worst. They created Stephen Crowder. Yeah, we are partially to blame for him. Jordan Peterson and a whole bunch of other right-wingers. But, you know, they go down to where the market is. <laughs> to where the right-wing market is. Okay, we also have uh, lots of horrible right-wingers up here that are influenced by American right-wingers. And it's, it's a, they do a lot of cross-border work with each other. Bill Williamson also likes all the flags behind me. Well, thank you. And really active in the chat. Uh, he also says, when you're Bill Maher, you can drop the N-word and be racist towards Muslims and use fake information. Yeah, he, he's racist in this too. We'll get to that. And Bill also did not know that Canada has a housing crisis. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> it's been going on for a while, but it's worse than what's happening in the States. So again, kernels of truth in what Bill is saying. Nina, Canadian, I support Canada taking refugees from countries in crisis. My life has been spent meeting global friends and listening to their stories. And we also took on a lot of refugees from Syria, from Ukraine right now. And that's also where a lot of our numbers are coming from, is, you know, doing the right thing in helping people who, who are facing catastrophe at home. Let's see. In a Canadian real estate inflated by international investment games, we open our doors to all cultures, though to push back some tough to push back sometimes. Yeah, there's a lot of foreign investors in our housing market, a lot of empty homes sitting that are not open to the market, which just makes scarcity in it, which causes the prices to go up and stay high. There are so many reasons why our housing crisis is the way it is. There's no one thing that causes it. And bringing in a lot of people right now is a contributing factor. There is no doubt about it. But trying to make it seem like it's the only factor is racist. 
uh, Kelly Bach, the author of the article, does not understand the difference between medium and average. Yes, medium means half above, half below. Average means, you know, uh, a bunch of people might have five, but then one person has a million and the average is a lot higher. <laughs> like it, it is, it could just mean that, you know, the gap between affordable homes and non-affordable homes are that much bigger or that there's more expensive homes versus like there, there's those aren't comparable numbers and i'm all for finding out that yeah it, it and i have admitted it's worse here our houses are more expensive but could you at least use comparable numbers if you're going to do this sources from the same site you know that are using the same metrics as opposed to picking one from here and there like there's no confirmation that they're even using the same quarterly analysis numbers with it Grand Theft Autobot. So how about title change of his show to Real Dumb with Bill Maher? <laughs> Nina Canadian, does Bill Maher just want to poke the bear? Does he talk crap to agitate people? Yeah, he does. That, that's part of what he does. Um, when people get outraged about what he's saying and then he gets to play, claim all the count, the cancel... Um, crowd and all that that we're trying to cancel him and blah 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 and he doesn't do freedom of speech and all that sort of stuff i'm not against him actually calling out canada but could you just be accurate about it there's lots to call out canada on <laughs> uh Nina Canadian, we are paying way too much for stuff in Canada. U.S. levels of profit should not be expected by corporations. Yeah. Uh, Andrew K. saying Yahoo is right-wing corporate news. It's awful. I don't, yeah, I don't use Yahoo News. And from what I saw just researching this, it just looks like it's a it's an aggregate of different news articles put together which then gets you the mixed matched uh, comparisons and stuff. Nina Canadian, this data is one glimpse. Don't make permanent judgments. Yeah, you have to look at, when it comes to things like housing costs and housing prices, you have to look at longer term trends. You have, even with the numbers of people coming into Canada, you have to look at longer term trends and what's happening to just cherry pick a quarter and say, you know, blank about it doesn't give you a full idea of trends and where it's going and patterns in the past or if it's doing good compared to like two years ago or what like it is just so cherry pick the information that he's presenting and some of it isn't even accurate as as you've seen and we'll get to more of <sighs> my dogs are goth yeah some people in the u.s haven't seen a doctor in years so yeah, in Canada, we might not have access to a family doctor, but we can still see a doctor for the most part. Um, and, you know, not being able to have a family doctor does have its issues when it comes to certain types of treatment and, and getting diagnosed with certain things. No doubt about it, it's a problem. But we still can see doctors and it doesn't cost us anything. Uh, let's see, oops, keeps on jumping down. Uh, Bill Williamson's, I don't know, I just dislike Canada. I view it like the USA best judge just more social in some ways, but extremely like the USA in other ways, and those other ways are bad. Yeah. That's your opinion. <laughs> Overall, I, I much rather be here than in the United States. Uh, Canada, to me, is much, much nicer place to live in, as in I wouldn't be alive right now had I had to rely on the American healthcare system like five times over and I wouldn't have the social safety nets that I currently have if I was in the United States and I don't have to worry about being shot 
when I just walk outside and a whole bunch of other things that uh, I'll put in my little wrap up of all this when I get to it. But part of the reason I have my channel is this country is far from perfect and it is slipping and I don't want it to and I want it to get better. And that's why I have this channel that I kind of, you know, I focus on Canadian issues for this reason. Uh, Grand Theft Autobot, uh, my spouse loves the gnome in Carbonite and wants to know where you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Glad that you noticed that's what this is. Uh, a friend made it for me. No, oh, You don't buy it. He made it. Uh, it's basically a gnome he got at the dollar store and he sliced in half and put it on a block of wood. Okay, so I'm going back and forth in this. Well, let's get back to this. So, proper screen. So, uh, this is just a continuation of what we were just talking about. So, it's Healthcare, not for a lack of spending, it spends over 13% of its economy on it, which is a lot. Talking about how much we spend on our healthcare. And like I mentioned, it, it's not as simple as that. A lot of money might be going towards our healthcare, but not necessarily going towards our healthcare, thanks to conservative left provinces. And so then he's just saying, and the moral of the tale is yes, you can move too far left. And when you do, you wind up pushing the people in the middle to the right. Uh, Canada's problem is not that it's too far left. Canada's problem is that we have so many people trying to drag it to the right and dismantling all of our socialized programs, defunding them, cutting back. And liberals are also responsible for some of this. The neoliberal uh, policies that they have in place, you know, housing, socialized housing hasn't kept up for decades. They started cutting it back and for decades it's been falling through the cracks and the liberals have had plenty of time to pick up the slack and they haven't. You know, the liberals have had plenty of time to improve on our healthcare situation, both provincially and federally, and they haven't. But that's not because they've gone too far left. That's because they've gone too capitalist. They're in the pockets of their buddies and corporations. They're, they're not in it for the average Canadian. So then we get into this. So now we just go completely transphobic for the next, like, bunch. Like, this segment that he did was only eight, eight odd minutes long. And he spends a good chunk of it on this story from years ago that was actually debunked. You see, this person here, not trans. So uh, Lemieux, whose pronouns are she, her, and those, which again, uh, making a joke about pronouns like that, <laughs> Kyla is now back to being a guy named Carrie. Well, that's the thing is that he was never trans. He is a right winger that was doing it for outrage. It, he was not ever trans. He was just doing it as outrage. And the way the right covered it was at first when he went to school dressed like that was oh, the transgenderism has gone too far in Canada and they're allowing all this to happen. It's what about the kids? This is this happening around the kids and all this sort of stuff? And outrage, outrage, outrage. But as soon as they found out that he actually presents like this the rest of the time at home with his families and neighbors and he, he dropped the costume altogether, 
all of a sudden he was a folk hero, a right-wing folk hero, pointing out the flaws in this very accepting system of uh, teachers who are trans. Suddenly he, he was a big hero, and the serfs actually covered this. And we'll watch a bit of that. Let me click here. Remember, about a year ago, probably less, the entirety of the right lost their mind. So this was about a year ago, and this video was about a year ago. So he's saying about a year ago, and this video was a year ago. So we're talking about Bill Maher covering or, or referencing something that's two years old at a bare minimum. Lines over a teacher all the way over in the made-up country of Canada, who apparently was trans and apparently had giant prosthetic breasts and the school had to allow them. A story came out recently revealing that the neighbors say that the individual in question does not dress up in that fashion when outside of the school and they uh, present as a man and use he him pronouns when interacting with the neighbors and other people in the town. And it seems like once again, this was a massive culture war thing that the right ran with. What's really interesting about the story is that the start of the story was Tucker Carlson being like expanding mummy milky milker, you know, just going off and uh, breasts, breasts, you know, he was like losing his mind and shit. Uh, but also at the same time talking about how degenerate and perverse it is. Like this is how far society has gone. You know, just another day in Weimar, you know, if, if not for this teacher, uh, we would have other forms of just disgusting depravity. So we have to put a stop to it. Once it started coming out that this person uh, apparently maybe trolling or maybe uh, putting on a act or maybe be doing it uh, just for uh, the pictures and uh, the hysteria. Uh, suddenly it was a hero. It switched. So the person's doing the same thing in both situations. In this situation, they're doing the same thing as they're doing in this situation. They're showing up to school in this attire. But in this situation, they're a degenerate pervert and a threat to kids. And in the other, when it flips, uh oh, well, they're a hero bringing light and attention to a very worthy cause. And so now we find ourselves in the beanie zone. Gentlemen, we. And people can go check out that video. Um, the surf, it's about a half hour long, and the surfs uh, go into it. But yeah, this was debunked over a year ago. And Bill Maher is using it now? He just randomly picks this one outlier story to go with now when talking about Canada. And he doesn't stop there. He gets even worse. So now he's uh, bringing in other countries, Europe. So effectiveness of puberty blockers for third graders. So this is from the NHS they recently uh, did some horrible things over in England. And there's the CAS report that just came out, which again is super cherry picked and biased and inaccurate and doesn't actually follow people who are trans and kids who are trans. And it is so wrong on so many levels. And here's Bill Maher just going for it. He's going for it too. And so here's the quote, not enough evidence to support the safety or clinical effectiveness. And he finishes this statement by saying effectiveness of puberty blockers for third graders. That's not what it says. So the actual document says, we have concluded that there is not enough evidence to support the safety or clinical effectiveness of puberty suppressing hormones to make the treatment routinely available at this time. And who they're talking about is under a new policy of England's National Health Service, puberty blockers will only be available to people under 18 as a part of research studies. So we're not talking about England just handing out puberty blockers to tiny children. And quite honestly, if you're in third grade, you're only like eight or nine. The whole point of puberty blockers is to delay puberty. If you're eight or nine years old and you've started puberty, 
you actually probably should be on puberty blockers. But they're not giving out puberty blockers to children who have not started puberty yet. That That's kind of the whole point of them. They don't just hand them out as soon as somebody says, oh, I think I might be trans. That's not when they just start handing out puberty blockers. So if you're eight or nine years old and you are starting to go through puberty, you might actually need puberty blockers. But this is targeted specifically towards children who are transgender. And it is preventing them from getting the medical health care that they need. And he's reading so many right-wing sources when it comes to the value of it. He's reading reports that are, are coming from white right-wing biases. And the thing about what's happening in England is there's so much turfness happening there that they are actually applying pressure on their government to prevent clinics from doing this, which actually is very harmful to the children. And so England's healthcare service to stop prescribing puberty blockers to transgender kids. And if we scooch down here, I don't have access to this article because I've tried to find it and it's not available, the whole NHS statement. Uh, so let's just go down to where was it that I wanted to go to? So some British politicians welcome NHS England's announcement. The UK's Health and Social Care Secretary, Victoria Atkins, said on X that care that affects our children's health and well-being so profoundly must always be based on clinical evidence. And the thing is, is that puberty blockers have been used for decades. They are safe. They are absolutely safe. They are reversible. It's just a whole bunch of transphobic nonsense being pushed into politics. Health Minister uh, Maria Clawfield Claw also welcomed the policy, calling it groundbreaking change as children's safety and well-being are paramount. Uh, Stonewall, an LGBTQ2S uh, campaign group in the UK, criticized Tuesday's announcement, writing in a statement that all trans young people deserve access to high quality, timely health care. So Bill Maher is using a cherry picked example from two years ago here in Canada and this UK study that just came out that is also highly cherry picked in order to get his transphobic narrative across. For some, an important part of this care comes in the form of puberty blockers, a reversible treatment that delays onset of puberty prescribed by experts and endocrinologists, giving the young person extra time to evaluate their next steps. Yes, over and over and over again, we have to state it for some reason that puberty blockers are reversible. They are. We are concerned that the NHS England will be putting new prescriptions on hold until research protocol is up and running at the end of 2024, the charity added. I want to do more research into the this here, the NHS statement, plus the CAS report that just came out. There's wonderful people on Twitter that are doing deep dives into this uh, that I will uh, be looking into and more in the future. Hopefully they can get onto programs and actually do a lot of the debunking, but there's so much to go over. Uh, Mermaids, a charity that supports trans, non-binary, and gender-questioning children and young people, said that the NHS announcements is deeply, deeply disappointing and a further restriction of support offered to trans children and young people through the NHS, which is failing trans youth. Gender-affirming care is medically necessary, evidence-based care that uses a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach to help a person transition from their assigned gender, the one the person was designated at birth, to their affirmed gender, the gender by which one wants to be known. Puberty blocking is a non-invasive therapy that can be reversed. Doctors inject a compound or use an implant that mimics the actions of a puberty stimulating hormone that is released in the brain known as that, that word, releasing hormone. The compound makes a pituitary gland less sensitive 
to that hormone and in doing so it essentially pauses puberty. Puberty starts again after the drugs are stopped. In the U.S., where several Republican-led states have banned gender-affirming health care for young people, every major medical association agrees that gender-affirming care is clinically appropriate for children and adults. This includes the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and the American A Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Gender-affirming care can include puberty blockers, which may not be a part of every association's uh, treatment. The AMA and LGBTQS, L, LGBTQ2S plus advocates stress that gender affirming care can be life saving treatment for trans youth. In the US, transgender and non binary youth are twice as likely to have attempted suicide compared to their cisgendered peers, according to a 2022 survey by the Trevor Project, a suicide youth prevention and crisis intervention organization for LGBTQS2. LGBTQ2S plus youth. So here, Bill Maher is basically trying to say that the United States is an outlier when it comes to how willing they are to help trans children transition and all that sort of stuff. And he's making it sound like we're, that they're so out of line with the other countries, but it's just because it's a more progressive policy. It's a more accepting policy in the United States here in Canada. When you have other countries that are going backwards, falling in line with them isn't exactly, you know, a, a good thing. And lots of trans children will suffer because of this. You know, you have other countries who won't help children to transition that are extremely queer phobic in general. Do you really want to be aligned with those countries? Like, is, is that what he's complaining, that you're not aligned with all the countries that are anti-trans, anti-queer? Because having children be able to access the health care that they need is actually a good thing. And the way that they're twisting it to make it sound like any sort of treatment, because he goes into... Um, into more, so, so too will all the other good place countries. <laughs> whatever that's supposed to mean, in the direct opposition to America's choice to affirm children's wishes on switching gender no matter their age or psychiatric history. So if we go back, the full statement again. So effectiveness of puberty blockers for third graders, so too with all the other good place countries in direct opposition to America's choice to affirm children's wishes on switching gender no matter their age or psychiatric history and i've had to go over this before and we always seem to have to mention this again really trying to fear monger about this because switching gender no matter their age that doesn't mean surgeries you know switching their gender when they're a child before puberty is presentation you know how they present taking on preferred pronouns changing their name wearing clothing that match their identity, that sort of thing. It, it, it's not, when you just say switching genders, no matter the age or psychiatric history, you're making it sound like, oh, they're doing surgeries on children, which isn't a thing. It's not a thing. Not even for teenagers. It's not a thing. And this is just right-wing fear-mongering about, oh, the children. We got to keep the children safe from this transgenderism. That's all this is. Uh, I just want to check to make sure that I didn't have more on that. Okay. So after he's done being transphobic, he goes into being anti-immigrant. And racist. Again, remember, this was about bashing Canada. But like all things, the only time Americans pay attention to what's happening outside of their country is when it benefits their talking points. Uh, so here he's saying Sweden opened its borders to over a million and a half uh, immigrants since 2010. And now 20% of its citizens are foreign born and its education system is tanking 
and it has Europe's highest rate of gangland killings. And in the background, he has these little graphs that say foreign born citizens now account for 20% of the nation's population. And these problems are amplified by deterioration of quality of education. And one result is that the far right parties are in the government. Now they are there for the first time. So he's saying that all these leftist policies are the reason why all these right wing governments are getting in because, oh no, they're letting in so many immigrants into Sweden. And that's, that's the problem. It's those immigrants. They're a problem. When in actuality, again, it's nuanced. <laughs> So from The Guardian, how game violence took hold of Sweden in five charts. Now, this one here that, um, if I go back here, does it show? New York Times is the uh, article that he was initially quoting from. Oh, no. <sighs> well, he was. I believe there was an article, okay, I guess I didn't include that in a graph, from New York Times where he was talking about um, the foreign-born citizens and the gangland violence and all that sort of stuff. And the article, I believe it was from the New York Times, was just sensationalizing uh, stories of violence from uh, people from outside of the country and all that sort of stuff. It didn't actually give you information on the cause and the nuance and things of that sort. So here we have from the Guardians, how gangland violence took hold of Sweden in five charts. Scandinavian countries has second highest gun crime death rate in, in Europe with poverty and inequity among driving factors. Oh, sorry, what was that? So kernel of truth, uh, Sweden has had a spike in gang violence, no doubt about it, but poverty and inequity among driving factors. And if we scooch down here, yes, yeah, Sweden's gun uh, gun crime death rate is now the second highest in Europe. So it's definitely like that is a real thing. Crime has spiked. But here we have poverty is the main driver of crime in violence hotspots. The Swedish police have identified a number of. Um, I don't know how to say this word. <laughs> and they referred to it a couple times. Uh, so or vulnerable areas across the country. These are home to just 5% of the country's population, but are connected with the most serious violence. While these areas do have high proportions of residents, both, while these areas do have high proportions of residents born outside of Europe and second and, second and third generation immigrants, they have been shaped by socioeconomic circumstances over a long period of time, a factor which experts say is of far greater significance than to the current situation. So it's not so much about letting the immigrants in that's causing the problems. It's the socioeconomic circumstances, the, the poverty that a lot of the immigrants find themselves in that is leading to the spike in crime, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Because, you know, can you see this correlation in every country that lets in large portions of immigrants? So more than 80% of the underlying statistical areas that make up the uh, vulnerable areas are defined as having a socioeconomic socio challenges, with half of them classed as having major challenges. Long-term unemployment rates are above the average in the majority of these areas and is increasing. Meanwhile, the proportion of people at risk of poverty defined as an economic standard of less than 60% of the medium is more than twice the national figure. It goes back to that thing that he was talking about, you know, Canada letting in all the immigrants and that's why there's a housing problem. And again, it is a contributing factor. But when you make it the only factor, that's racist. When you're blaming the spike in crime just on immigration, without any nuance, without, you know, going into it, that is racist. That is Bill Maher being racist. And remember, this whole 
new rules of his was about bashing Canada. So now he has to, you know, also go into uh, the UK and Sweden and other countries and point out how their leftism is so bad. And so he says with all of these left-wing policies that we seem to have, and one result is that the far-right parties are in the government now, they are for the first time. So he's saying that because of all these left-wing socialists, we've gone so far left that th there's been this backlash and this rise in crime and the rise in housing prices, and that's why right-wing governments are, are getting into power. Again, missing all the nuance there. A lot of it has to do with American influence. A lot of it has to do with how the right-wing networks around the world, how they support each other, how they... Um, influence each other, how they export their hatred to other countries. It's very nuanced as to why right-wing governments are on the rise. And then he goes on to say, to which liberals say blaming immigrants for the rising crime rate is racist. Yeah, but is it true, is what he's saying. And then he says, of course it's true. And you see, I'm, I'm going to kind of change the inflection here. So to which liberals say, blaming immigrants for the rising crime rate is racist. Yeah, but is it true? Of course it's true. Yes, it is true that blaming immigrants for the rise in, in crime is racist. But that's not how he's saying it. He's saying that immigrants are causing the rise in crime. And, and he's saying, it's true that it's the immigrants causing the rise in crime as opposed to, you know, all the socioeconomic issues. And then he says, it's not a coincidence that quality of life went down after the Somali gang started a drug turf war. Oh, that's the New York Times article that I was talking about earlier. That's just sensationalized stories of violence out of context. And so, so yeah, it's those immigrants that cause the quality of life to go down as opposed to, again, all the socioeconomic causes and things of that sort. So that was the Bill Maher segment. I'm not too sure how coherent. I'm, I'm not. Normally when I do a debunking like this, I like to script it out to make sure that I have everything straight. I hope that I was able to communicate everything I wanted to. But in a nutshell, and I also see people arguing in the sandbox, um, and, and I just want to remind people, it's okay to not agree. Like Bill Williamson uh, doesn't seem to, you know, like Canada, doesn't care about Canadian politics. That's okay. It's okay. From the sounds of it, he's American and, you know, it's fine. He can disagree. It's his opinion. People don't need to pile on him because of it. Let's put it that way. Uh, the only time I get concerned with comments in the sandbox are if um, you're using language that is potentially hurtful, uh, slurs, things of that sort, that's a definite no-no. Um, but to simply just disagree and say you don't like Canada, that's that's fine. I don't have an issue with him saying that. But if he were to start saying because they're all slur, 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 this and that and the other thing, um, made up reason, made up reason, made up reason, then I get a little bit more concerned. But, you know, everyone's perspective of what other countries are like are tainted by the country you grew up in. And most people... Uh, it, it's impossible to know which country is the best country to live in because of how we grew up, all that sort of stuff. There's so much that goes into it. Uh, so, so you don't have to, to, um, you know, go after him because of it, because it's like, as I will say, I'm not a fan of the United States. I see what's happening there and I see all the harm they're doing. And I'm not a fan of it, but I'm also not a fan of law what Canada does. And that's what I stick to. I stick to 
you know, the issues in, I want to focus on ways to improve the country. And in order to improve the country, in order to get over the issues, we have to first acknowledge what those issues are. And that is what I'm doing with my channel is I'm acknowledging what those issues are with Canada. And there's a lot of them. But overall, like I was mentioning before, I'm grateful that I live in Canada. It has benefited me. And I'd much, much, much rather be here than in the United States. With all the anxiety, with the conversations, like with everything I've learned about the United States, I'm far better off here. Because I, I, I caught people, I think it was Bill saying that, you know, not all Americans are worried about being shot and stuff like that. But I've also had plenty of conversations with students, Americans coming over here saying that it's a night and day transformation when they come here. Because there's a constant underlying anxiety that they're not even aware of. And then as soon as they got here and the gun culture is so drastically different, this anxiety suddenly drained away from them. Anxiety they didn't even know that was constantly nagging at them until they were outside of it. It's like, does a fish feel water type thing? And so it's not until they're exposed and actually living in a situation where it's not the same, do they realize how much it was affecting them. And I have a lot of American friends and a lot of them know of at least one person who has been shot or shot at, not necessarily killed. Like a lot of them were wounded or they were just shot at, or they've heard gunfire. And a lot of it does have to do on um, where people live, that sort of thing. That is not something I've ever had to worry about in all the places I've lived in Canada. And I've lived in a few different places. And of all the Canadians I know, no one has ever said that this is something that's on their mind, that it's an issue. Like, I know there's a spike in gang violence in Toronto and that there is a spike in gun violence in Toronto. But it's so drastically different here than what it is in the United States when it comes to gun culture. And, you know, I acknowledge the faults in Canada. I acknowledge that this is far from a perfect country, but I'm also very grateful that I am here based on the fact that I'm non-binary. You know, and being non-binary in a lot of other countries would not be accepted. We have more protections here. So while we do have a conservative government threatening to start uh, taking away the rights of trans people, and in some provinces, they're doing that through the school boards. They're also being fought back against because we're better protected under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms here. We have far better protections than in the United States. And, you know, it, it is just all individual perspective. I don't mind Americans calling out Canadians or Canada, just do it accurately. You know, I would appreciate it if names that get millions and millions of views in the United States actually did call out Canada more, but accurately. Because the only time Canadians really seem to pay attention to what's going on here is when Americans say something. Like, it actually makes our news when Canada makes American news. Like, it will be like, Oh my God, this was so bad. America covered it. And then the, and then we'll actually hear about the story. Like Fox News will cover Canada, but it's totally to say like Justin Trudeau is a dictator and all this sort of stuff. Again, drastically misrepresenting what's happening up here. And then they want to blame everything on our leftist policies that were so socialist up here, that were so left wing, when in actuality, that's not the problem. It's the right wing coming in and stripping away every socialist program that we had in place. That's what's causing Canada to fall apart right now. That's what's causing our healthcare to fall apart. That's what's causing the housing crisis is for all of the, the socialism that we have being wrecked. And it's done so purposely because 
a lot of people in the government, mostly conservatives, want to privatize things because it means more money for corporations and their rich buddies. Liberals could have done so much more to put protections in place. They could have done so much more to, to right the wrongs that have happened, but they've chosen to do, they do, they throw out crumbs every now and then. That's what we're getting right now from the liberals with Justin Trudeau. We're just getting crumbs. Enough just to keep the masses a little bit happy, but distract from the fact that we're still nowhere near where we should be. And that's because of the neoliberal policies. Like, the liberals are not on the left. And, you know, they are center-right at this point. And so when you look at what the liberals are doing and saying, see, these are the policies that the liberals are putting through and they're so left wing and that's why the country is falling apart. It's like, no, it's because they've gone center right. That's the problem. The NDP is pretty much sitting in the center right now. And they used to be the leftist progressive party here in Canada. There is no leftist progressive party in Canada pushing policy. None. There are individuals within the NDP that push for it, but the NDP on a whole does not. You know, it's means-tested dental care. It, it's means-tested, you know, pharma care. It, it's, can we please get a little bit of this or that or the other thing? And, but they're not actually going for full-out socialized programs. So much needs to be done in this country just to get back to where we were about, you know, 10, 20 years ago with our housing, with our house health care. And I wish, again, I wish I could get more traction because if my channel does nothing else, the thing I want it to do is to let ca Canadians know what is happening to our health care. Because it is, it is falling apart, but it's not because of the socializing, it's because of the dismantling of the socializing from conservative provinces. That's the problem. It's not because we've gone so left wing, it's because we're going right wing. That's what's causing the problem. There is no massive left wing influence in Canada pushing policy. That, that is the simple crux of it and we need it. We need it here in this country. But then we have idiots like Bill Maher getting up in front of his audience of millions and millions and millions pushing, you know, things that aren't true, aren't accurate, need nuance, are flat out false. And then saying it's because we're too left wing. And he likes to say that because he doesn't want to acknowledge how right wing he is. He wants to think that he, he considers himself a cent, you know, in the center, you know, he, he's part of the center and that's where he would like to think of himself as opposed to actually acknowledging the fact that he's transphobic and racist and on the right, because a lot of people in the center center don't want to acknowledge that they're part of the right wing because that, you know, that is what people think of when they think of racist and queer phobic and all that sort of stuff. And they don't want to be associated with that brand of hate. But they are still in that brand of hate. They're just trying to rosy it up a bit. Huh. Uh, let's, let's check the sandbox, shall we? Yeah, and that, I just covered two things and that was a really long time. <laughs> and I knew that these two things would, would take a long, long time. Uh, on Wednesday, I'm being joined by C's. Again, he's coming back on my show. Didn't scare him off the first time. So he'll be back on and we'll have some fun stuff. And then I think I need to take a little bit of an extended break. Uh, just so I can get caught up. There's so many things that have to be done that even with two shows a week, it's still a bit much for me to get all these other things done. Uh, Kelly Bach just pointing out, um, US kids have active shooter drills. Do Canadians? No, we do not. At least not as far as I know. 
again, it's a different culture. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nina Canadian says active shooter drills here. Scary learning curve for me as college worker. Uh, so are you seeing that they have started um, shooter drills here in Canada? Yeah, it seems to be a lot of back and forth. So just like I said, like Bill is free to have his opinions. Everyone else is also free to have their opinions about how Canada is actually better. Uh, my dogs are goth. There were over 600 mass shootings in 2023 in the United States. Yes. So Bill says, if you guys took me being serious, yes, I, yes, I, as an American view, Canada is just bad as my country and am anti-Canada because people suffer just like here in the U.S. I can't say I'm anti-U.S., even though I still think Canada is better is there's pros and cons and it's the people that I'm more concerned about. Both the governments can go to hell. It's the people I worry about. Um, uh, zero PE, I'm at the point where I don't call myself American anymore. I'm domestically colonized by a rogue state. Uh, so, my dogs are goth, you like the U.S. better, and some of us like Canada better. What is the issue, Bill? Yeah, a lot back and forth with that. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, yeah, I think it looks like things are starting to get a little bit out of hand with this back and forth. Uh, again, people are free to have their opinions. It's really only if people start using slurs or um, write out misinformation or, or try to be hurtful. That's That's when I care. Because the sandbox should be a safe place to state your opinions, to talk about what you want. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, welcome, Mitty Doctors. Hate when. Hate that when it happens, not sure what you're referring to. Let's see, let's see. Let's 
still all about that back and forth. Uh, Looney Tunes 9000, New York Times supports Bill Maher? Yeah, I don't know, but Bill Maher seems to be supporting New York Times. Uh, Hunger Games 1989, I live in Minnesota and they like to call my governor a dictator and oh, I just laugh. Yeah. All the times Fox News has referred to like Justin Trudeau as a dictator and all this sort of stuff because of his radical leftism. But then they also call him a communist, which, you know, whatever. Um, and it's just because they don't like a lot of what yeah it's they just don't like people having actual freedoms you know the freedom to be who they are because that feels like they they seem to think it's infringing on their freedom to be hateful bigoted people when other people get to express who they are Uh, Mars Falcon noticed that the right wing hack frauds and the really real leftists purer than the driven snow, so pure that they won't vote for centrists. Let those authoritarian win that that call liberal fascists. I I think I get what you're going with here. Uh, like when it comes down to it, do I like Justin Trudeau? No. I prefer him over Pierre Polyev. Zero PE, they say they are left but spew right wing concepts. I haven't looked into it, but it wouldn't surprise me if Jesse Singal has been on Bill Maher's show. <laughs> surprise Anna hasn't been on there yet. Yes, Looney Tunes 9000 sees as our guest Wednesday at 6 p.m. He has agreed to come back on my show, so I didn't scare him off the first time. He won't get another Canadian pop quiz. I only do that the first time Americans come on my show. <laughs> uh, Bill, you're looking for some recommendations. Um, you can, I, I would suggest you try checking out the Power Report with Dan from the internet on YouTube. Give me more than maybe next slide. Box has new about it. I'm not sure what that means. Oh. Oh, people recommending different YouTube channels. Hunger Games 1989, my governor is doing good things, but I wouldn't call him a dictator. I would credit the state representatives for the policy before calling my governor a dictator. <sighs> so, uh, 
so much stuff. Uh, uh, let's see, let's see. Is that what I wanted? Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, feel my feel good tweet. <laughs> Uh, I, I thought it might be nice to unwind with something a little nice. Uh, let's let's do this. Uh, hyper realistic paintings that look like photos of thread. Apparently, this is a painting. Absolutely wild. Like I want to get back into painting, but I see something like this, and it's just like, wow. Um, and that's Alyssa Monks that did that. And then here's another beautiful painting. This is a painting. Just like to get the reflection and everything in it. Beautiful. I've seen some pencil work that kind of looks like this, but seeing it as a painting too, is just like you would never know, never know that these were paintings. This one, I, I think this one has a couple of tells that it might be a painting. It's like, it looks realistic, but I also know what pomegranates look like. And this is not necessarily right on, but still just absolutely stunning, gorgeous. Like, and it's like, I wonder like, what was the motivation to paint this? You know, to paint the, this pomegranate open like this. Like, what was the motivation behind this? Was it just the colors? Like, there's always so much I want to know about some of this stuff. And then here you can actually see the artist working a little bit on this large painting. And that's the thing, like, I find with my drawing is part of the reason why I like to do larger drawings is it's actually... I find it easier to make it more realistic the larger it is because then you get to do like the smaller details and stuff of that sort. But like here, everything about like the hair, the way it sparkles in the water, it's just so beautiful. Like when I get back into my painting, like I don't know if I would want to be this hyper realistic because. You know, a part of my drawing, a part of my painting is I still want it to have my style. Uh, so this one, apparently, this contemporary artist portraits are considered the most realistic in the world. And can I zoom in on this one? I tried zooming in. Can I zoom in on... Oh, how do I zoom in? How do I zoom in? I was able to zoom in on my phone. <laughs> um, I don't know how to zoom in on desktop when using um, Twitter because like I zoomed in just to see like the different shading and stuff under the knitted fabric and it is just wild. And it, it again, I like I wonder like what is the motivation behind some of these paintings? Is it just an image they saw in their head? Or are they duplicating another picture? Uh, is it commission? You know, I'm just so curious about a lot of that sort of stuff. Actually, with that, let's see if I can do that. No, that won't do anything. I 
I only hope that I can even do like remotely this good when I get back into painting, but just like being able to paint the water like this and everything, it looks so real. But look at that. It's, it's a, that's a large picture. But again, to me, it's easier when I'm drawing to do the larger drawings because for their realism, because that's when you get to add in like all the little details and stuff. And I don't know why, like, again, this goes behind the motivation. I don't know why a lot of artists, when it comes to like hyper-realistic paintings and drawings, they like to add water. And I don't know why that is. Like if the water, like if there's a reason for it in a lot of them, or if it's just for the sake of making it look more dramatic. Um, I think this one said, this is a drawing, not a painting. This one, again, just wild, wild that you can paint something like this. It's definitely something I work towards. Because even if I decide to do something for with my own style, there's still, you know, you still got to get certain fabric waves down and things of that sort. You know, certain um, elements that you can just add together because... Like, ideally, I want to get to the point where I don't have to rely on photographs for my drawing or painting, and I can just see the vision in my head and work on it there. So here's another one of these paintings, and again, they're super large. And I think with painting, with the drawing, it's making them big, which actually makes them hyper-realistic. Because it just allows for those little details that you just can't do when it's so much smaller. Yeah, I have another drawing that I want to get working on soon. <laughs> Still, I don't know. I don't know why people would want to draw a bunch of Coke cans, but. <laughs> Love this one, tiger. Yeah, I don't know if they were done this one yet or not, but you can tell like in the face of this one in particular, at least on my screen, that it's a painting. And I think they might not be done yet because all they have to do is add more depth to the face and absolutely nailed it. But it's still just stunning, beautiful work there. Absolutely gorgeous. Again, I, I don't know if you're going to do a painting, like why, why put in like the saran wrap shirts like that? Again, it, it's just the questions that I have, like, what's the inspiration? Is it just because they like the look? That sort of thing. And just when you look at something like this too, you have to be so precise, like with angles and, and straight lines and curves and things of that sort. Like it'd be very difficult. I doubt that they completely freehanded this one. Like they probably had to use measurements and rulers and stuff. But just the level of detail on this is amazing with the reflections and like in the brickwork even. Just absolutely amazing. All the little details of the little signs and... Yeah, I can dream big that someday I'd be that good. And it's like, I wonder, like, are they using um, photographs or is this from their mind? I'd love to sit down and have like a round table with a whole bunch of other artists and, and see where they get their inspiration from.
and find out why they do certain drawings and paintings and stuff. <clears throat> But it's one of the things like you look at this and then you know it's possible. And so then I think to myself, then why can't I do it? And I don't mean that as like, why can't I do it? It's why can't I, you know, why, why, what's stopping me from getting there? And I don't like, I have within me, I think the skill to be able to do this. So what's stopping me? Well, let's just practice right now. I need more time to just practice and work on my art. Beautiful stuff. Mm. Hey. So, yeah. A lot they covered today. Well, a lot by only two stories, but they were really long. Uh, on my YouTube page, please go there from time to time. And if you see that there's a video that is like near the 100 view mark, please give it a watch. <laughs> I, I want to try to make sure that all my videos can get over at least 100 views to help it in the algorithm. You don't have to watch it. You can click on it, mute it, go to a different tab. Every day we count as a new view. I do it on my computers. I, I click them in the background and work on something else so that I can uh, artificially increase the view count because the more that happens, then the better chance that it has in the algorithm. And then who knows, maybe I get a whole bunch more trolls going into my comment section to say, I don't know why this showed up, but immediately I have to come here and comment on it, <laughs> which then helps it in the algorithm to go into more recommends for more trolls to find. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you are, if you, if you just have the extra screen available or something, if you could do that, that would really help. Don't forget to like and share. I put a lot of work into this one today, so please like and share. I've been working since noon. <laughs> Trying to get all of that together and stuff. That's a problem. I get so hyper-focused on doing this stuff that I, I forget to do much of anything else. And I wasn't planning on working on it this much today. <laughs> uh... Uh, Frodo is still doing well. He walked in here earlier, but he didn't come close enough for to come on my lap. Let's see if I can call any one over. Abernathy. Abernathy. Linear. Let's see if any of the babies come out. Uh, but yeah, any help with his ongoing vet bills would be greatly appreciated. You can do that by using the PayPal link in the description box below or by sending an e-transfer to sandylovis at gmail.com. Only if you're Canadian, because Canada rocks. <laughs> uh, and you can go and check out my art at sandylovis.com. Oh, we got Lanier. Come here. Come here, Lanier. You can jump up. People want to see you. You're so cute. You're so cute. <laughs> this one is Lanier. Um... Also in the description box, I have an Amazon wish list. Uh, anything from there can help if it's building my YouTube studio, my art studio, um, just things to make me smile, things for my cats. Every little bit helps. Uh, I've, I've had some bills. I've had some expenses recently and I, I need help getting that under control. So any help with that, again, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Like if you can become a patron, Super appreciate it, but I also understand, you know, if you can't, uh, liking, sharing, all that sort of stuff, getting me in the mentions of other leftist content creators are, is helpful uh, to help just get my channel out there more. 
are ways that people can help if you don't have any extra spending cash and I don't want people sending me money if you need it. <laughs> uh, you know, priorities. Uh, so let's check the sandbox one more time and then I am done. I am done. <laughs> Uh... Nina Canadian, in our part of the world, uh, Southern Ontario, Canada, Jack Chambers and East Coast artists like Mary Pratt created style photorealism. Yeah, I would love to be able to do photorealism, but from the images from my head that I see. That's what I would love to be able to do. Because I do see images in my head of artwork I would love to do, but it's a matter of translating that onto paper or paint. And there's a painting I want to do. There's a few paintings. There's a lot of paintings I want to do. So I need, I need time to get back into that. There's some drawings I want to work on. Yeah, that's why I think after a while, um, after the Wednesday show with C's, I'm going to take a little bit of a longer break. Um, just with banking and everything else and the book, <laughs> the book that I have. I have a hard time focusing on more than one thing at a time. And so by the time I'm done the live stream and then break it up into segments, upload those, make the thumbnails, it's like, uh, it takes so much time. <laughs> and then when I'm done all of that, I just want a day where I just do nothing. Uh Let's see. Nina Canadian, you show me this, you sign up for an art history lesson. Mud buds wonder how much that costs. Yeah, I don't know how much they would charge for their artwork. It, it, it's usually done based on how long it takes people. Also the quality and stuff. Like I know a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people who want to buy my art don't like the price of my commission portraits. But I've seen paintings in galleries and drawings in galleries where mine technique and detailed and realistic wise far, far better. And what they're asking for is far, far more than what I'm charging. Um, it, it all depends. What I like, I still feel that what I charge for my commission portraits is reasonable for what you get and for how long it takes me to do them. Um, and then there's some artwork that I see that it looks like it only took them 20 minutes and yet they're charging way more than I would ever charge. But then there's really realistic drawings that I see where they charge a lot less than what I do because they're able with their techniques to just pump them out. Usually like with graphite uh, stuff and stuff, they can just, you know, make them really quickly and stuff. So it, it yeah. Uh, I'm still seeing more back and forths with Bill. I'm not aware enough of very simple political ideas. So how do we support that idea over? Well, I'm not sure which idea we're talking about. Let's see. Um, Bill, I think from the looks of it, you're trying to expand your knowledge of like just political theory and things of that sort. And I, all I would do is recommend like watch different political takes from different people. Um, if I, I don't know much in the way of books to read other than like actual, here's a textbook on Canadian politics. 
because uh, I have a hard time focusing on just reading material. But there's lots of different political YouTubers out there. Uh, and the more you watch, the more it starts falling into your algorithm. Because you also have the majority report, you have the serfs. Um, like I said, Dan from the internet has the power report. Uh, leftist mafia, which would then branch off into a whole bunch of different people. Uh, so it's just, it's exposure uh, to different ideas. We're not all the same. Um, so I usually try to bring in the perspective of somebody who's non-binary, queer. I also live with disabilities. And so I tend to speak a lot about disabilities, which I find a lot of the leftist content creators tend to leave out of the conversation a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight either. It takes time to form a lot of these opinions to see what's out there. So, you know, it, it might take a while to, for things to click and well, that's okay. It's, it's just working towards the, uh, towards the, Basically, what I hope all most leftist channels are trying to do is just work towards a, the most positive outcome for the most amount of people. But a lot of the language around like left and right and what that means, it all gets skewed out of context and stuff because a lot of the centrists and right wingers, when they refer to radical left wing and all this sort of stuff, they're sensationalized, they're blowing out of proportion, they're taking out of context and, and can really taint people's idea of what's on the left. And yeah, so just take a peek outside of your bubble and see what's there. Zero PE. I consume so much leftist content here on YouTube that my family thinks I'm an expert when I'm not. I just know how to see through the BS better than normies. With a lot of things, are you considered an expert if you just know more than average? Maybe not an expert, but to people who know a lot less than average, then you might seem like an expert. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, like, I don't consider myself an expert in using Excel spreadsheets because I know what experts in Excel spreadsheets can do. However, when it comes to the general population, I'm an expert in Excel spreadsheets and what I can do. Uh, Uh, Looney Tunes only linear came in for a brief moment. Like Abernathy again was in here earlier, but I was too focused on this and I didn't call him over. Uh... Well, thank you for coming out, Bill. Uh, says that you came here for the Iran talk, but, uh, came in a bit late. Looks like non-commitment chick is roasting TYT again. If people want to go and check out that channel. Uh... Zero PE, I'm subscribed to at least 100 channels, LOL, and it's crazy. My entrance to the left was TYT and Kyle Kalinske back in 2018 to better understand electoralism. Anyway, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. So all the things. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. Thank you to the mods. And uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern, right here with C's. So until then, salut à la prochaine. Thank you for watching and stay tuned. I'm Sandy, wishing your tomorrow is better than your today.